Good evening. Good evening. There, that's better. Okay, uh, I'm Doug Kinchy, the director of the Kaufman Interfaith Institute, and I am so pleased to welcome you here. Members of the community, members of the student body, faculty, staff, and a whole group from Hope College, right? <laughs> Glad to have you here. As I understand it, this is a class that has been reading Ibu Patel's book, Acts of Faith. They finished the book and they wanted to hear it direct from the author's mouth. So you're going you're gonna to hear it tonight and I'm sure you're going to be pleased. Uh, the Kaufman Institute has been in operation since 2010. And it's our mission to bring people together who may not agree with each other. Because we believe that the future of our country and the future of the world is not everyone agreeing or everyone being forced to agree by some power or authority, but people coming together through understanding and through doing service together to make a better community. And that's what we're all about. And we're so happy that we can invite you and other members of the community. We've been working for five years now, primarily in the community, with our Year of Interfaith Understanding in 2012, which had over 300 events, interfaith events in the greater Grand Rapids area, and now our Year of Interfaith Service, where we're turning from talk to action, from understanding to service. And this is a long-term agenda, and I'm sure you'll hear more about this from our guest, Eva Patel. So Grand Valley State University, Grand Rapids community, Community, the Kaufman Institute welcomes you to tonight's event. To introduce our speaker, I'm asking Katie Gordon, who's our program manager, but maybe more importantly, or at least in her eyes maybe, a graduate of the Interfaith Youth Corps training program. She has been working with Ibu Patel for about five years now, and so I've asked her to introduce our guest. Katie? Good evening, everyone. As Doug said, I have the great pleasure of introducing Ibu Patel um, tonight, not only because I am the program manager of the Kaufman Interfaith Institute, I'm also the staff advisor for Better Together, which is Grand Valley's student interfaith organization, but primarily as someone who has worked with Ibu for the last five years um, through Interfaith Youth Corps and the staff that he has down in Chicago. And in these five years I've been the, uh, that I've been involved with this work, the skills I've gained are invaluable. I've learned how to voice my values, engage across difference, and act collaboratively toward the common good. But most meaningfully, I've built relationships with other interfaith leaders that span across our own community and across the globe now, who all have one thing in common, and that's that we've all been a part of helping realize the vision of Interfaith Youth Corps to make interfaith cooperation a social norm. And thus, we have had the privilege to know Ibu Patel as our inspiration, our mentor, and our friend. So Ibu Patel, as president and founder of the Interfaith Youth Corps, is a leading voice in the movement for interfaith cooperation. He is the author of Acts of Faith, Sacred Ground, and the forthcoming Interfaith Leadership. Named by US News and World Report as one of America's best leaders in 2009, Ibu served on President Obama's inaugural Faith Council and regularly contributes to the public conversation around religious pluralism in America. He holds a doctorate in the sociology of religion from Oxford University, where he studied on a Rhodes Scholarship. And for over 15 years, Ibu has worked with governments, social sector organizations, and college and university campuses to help realize a future where religion is a bridge of cooperation rather than a barrier of division. So please join me in welcoming Ibu Patel to speak to us tonight. Thank you so much. I am thrilled to be here. Yeah, you folks in West Michigan know how to keep people busy. I've had all kinds of fun. There's been no lack of intellectual conversation and great interaction. Um, I love this place, Grand Valley State. Uh, you ought to be really proud of what you have built here. Um, I also love Hope College. Shall I, uh, shall I tell a Hope College story? Yes. All right. So. This must be 10 years ago, and um, I've been married, I'm recently married, married one or two years, and uh, recently birthed Interfaith Youth Corps. And um, I'm not a very balanced person at the time, and the birth of Interfaith Youth Corps is crowding out the marriage in my life. And my wife is telling me, you better take me away for a weekend, and you better not mention the word interfaith. You better not say the words Martin Marty 
or Jane Addams or Dorothy Day or any variety of interfaith leaders you might have been inspired by, you better just focus on Shanaz Mansouri this weekend. We choose the beautiful state of Michigan for our weekend getaway. We're in Holland or South Haven or something. I actually focus 36 hours on my wife. I'm feeling like a very good husband. It is Sunday at the bed and breakfast. I'm flipping through the local paper and I stop. I freeze. And my wife's like, what? And I'm like, baby, how much do you love me? <laughs> And she's like, this better not be. And I'm like, Jim Wallace is preaching at Hope College <laughs> at 11 a.m. Can we go? <laughs> she's like, there are going to be a lot of diamonds you need to pay for this <laughs> over the course of the next 10 years. But she is wonderful. We went, and then Jim Wallace got banned from our house for the next five years. I could no longer say the name. But we went to Hope College. You all know who Jim Wallace is? Oh, you need to know who Jim Wallace is. That's the next lesson for the Hope College Honors Program. <laughs> so Jim Wallace is one of the great Christian social action heroes of our time and was a, uh, an early mentor to me in, in interfaith work. I actually took a pilgrimage to visit the office at Sojourners uh, when I was living in Catholic worker houses in the summer of 1995. And uh, he wasn't at the office, and his assistant said, uh, um, Jim Wallace is only here one day this month. He's on book tour. He's only here one day. He's at his house doing laundry, and he's getting back on the road tomorrow. I'm like, where does he live? <laughs> and I went and I sat on his porch, and I made him come talk to me. So if you want to know what obsessive looks like, you're <laughs> You have, some, you have the, the picture in the dictionary when it comes to obsessive about interfaith work. So my goal here is to make you a little bit more obsessive about interfaith work in the course of this talk and conversation. I actually want to begin with a set of uh, snapshots of American life. First snapshot. Last year, about this time in the NFL season, the New England Patriots are in Kansas City playing the Chiefs. Hussein Abdullah, the great defensive back of the Chiefs, who has recently done Hajj, took, out, took off an entire NFL season to go do Hajj. That's how important his Muslim faith was to him. Has an inkling in the locker room before the game that the Chiefs were going to play great, and he was going to play great. And he thinks to himself, if I get a pick six tonight off of Tom Brady, I'm going to do a Muslim prayer in the end zone. Second half, that's exactly what happens. He catches Brady off at about midfield, runs it back, six points, and he goes down, forehead and nose to the ground, and the sijda al shukr, the prayer of thanksgiving. The ref pulls the yellow flag and gives him 15 yards. Excessive celebration. Did you ever see Tim Tebow get flagged for excessive celebration? No. There's a prayer exemption, a religious exception to that rule. You can pray as a matter of celebrating. It's in the NFL rule books. So why did Hussein Abdullah get flagged? The next day, the NFL Referees Association apologized. The referee didn't know what Mr. Abdullah was doing, was prayer. If you are an NFL ref, heck, if you're a college ref, I promise you the athletes you deal with are going to be religiously diverse. And they are going to pray before games. And they are going to stop for moments during games when an athlete from either team gets injured. They might pray as a matter of celebration. And if a whole team prays, you might have an agnostic or an atheist who respectfully stands aside because that does not resonate with his particular connection to the universe. If you are a coach or a ref at any level, you are going to have to deal with religious diversity. I promise you, NFL refs this season know what Muslim prayer looks like. Scenario number two. A few months ago, terrible tragedy in New York City. Officer Wen Jen Liu of the New York Police Department is killed in the line of duty. And as the NYPD prepares to say goodbye to one of its fallen brothers, and they have the person who arranges funerals, visit with the family, they discover something. Mr. Liu is not an Italian or an Irish Catholic. 
as many members of the force are. He is not accustomed, his family is not accustomed to funerals that are held in quiet, large churches full of officers in pressed Navy uniforms and dignitaries coming to the microphone, the mayor, the commissioner of police, and giving long speeches. His family is accustomed to small, loud, mournful goodbyes to their loved ones. They are accustomed to wailing and sobbing openly with a picture of the departed placed in the center of the room, garlanded with flowers. They take paper money and throw it at the picture to ensure the prosperity and security of the departed in the afterlife. Wen Jin Lu was a Chinese Buddhist, and this is how his family, his religion, mourns their dead. Well, you can imagine the challenge that presented the New York Police Department, because those officers also wanted to mourn somebody they considered a brother in arms. So what do you do if you are the person who arranges the funerals? Well, in one case, I guess you do both. But what if the family is so in mourning, so deep in grief, that they don't want to come to the traditional Roman Catholic funeral? If you work for the New York Police Department, you better know how to do funerals for a range of religious traditions. Heck, if you work for the Grand Rapids, or the Detroit, or the Chicago, or the Holland Police Department, your police officers are no longer just a single religion. They're going to start looking like the religious diversity of this country. Scenario number three from a great, great book called The Spirit Catches You and You Fall Down. Anybody know this book? It's a book about a Hmong family, H-M-O-N-G. The Hmong are mountain people from Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, Vietnam, allies of the United States in the Vietnam War in the 1960s and early 1970s. As gratitude for that, the United States resettles several hundred thousand of them here in the Midwest largely, Minnesota and Wisconsin, and also out west. One family, family of Leanne Lee, a little girl, has a tragedy befall them. Or maybe a tragedy plus something else, depending on your religious perspective. Their one-year-old daughter, Leanne, starts to shake and convulse. Her eyes roll into the back of her head. She loses consciousness. This happens multiple times. The family takes her to the hospital. The doctors, I think the technical term is freak out. There's a one-year-old girl having seizures. The doctors go I immediately into emergency medical mode. They do Everything you would imagine needs to be done in Western medicine for a one-year-old girl having seizures. But it doesn't fully connect with the family of Leanne Lee. Because the family of Leanne Lee are Hmong shamans. And the tradition in the shaman tradition suggests that our souls come from elsewhere. And occasionally, they depart. They leave again. And they need to be recaptured. They need to be reimplanted in our bodies. And the person who can do that is a shaman, somebody who travels between the physical world and the material world. They looked at their daughter, Leanne, and they said, this isn't primarily a medical issue. This is primarily a spiritual issue. We need to sacrifice the right number of animals so that a shaman may travel to the spirit world, exchange the souls of these animals for the soul of our daughter, and plant it back in her body. This complicates things considerably because the family of Leanne Lee believes that the medicine that the doctors are giving her blocks her soul coming back into her body. So they no longer give Leanne this medicine. 
They are suspicious that the doctors continue to change the dosages. They are angry that the doctors never speak to them as adults. Angry that the doctors never do house, house calls. Angry that the doctors routinely ask invasive questions, that they draw blood, that putting somebody under is a routine practice in a Western hospital. If you lose consciousness in the Hmong tradition, the chance of your soul departing is even higher. Most of all, they are struck that the doctors do not seem to understand that in addition to there being a physical challenge, there is something perhaps spiritually magnificent happening. Because the way that the Hmong believe shamans are prepared is by seizures in their youth. Leanne needs to have her soul returned from the spirit world. That is a challenge. But it may be that the spirit world is preparing her for something magnificent. The spirit world might be preparing her to be one who one day exchanges souls, to be the most vaunted figure in the Hmong community, a shaman. The doctors, I think the technical way of understanding this, all of this just goes like this for them. They just don't get it at all. And they are eminently frustrated that this family refuses to give medicine to their 12, 15, 18-month-old daughter who is having seizures to the point where they call in the child welfare system in the state of California, have police officers show up at the Lee's door and take Leanne away for six months because they say they are unfit as parents. The anthropologist who writes this book you can see her fit of rage as she says, how can these doctors consider these parents unfit? Did they not know that they had used three months salary to do a road trip across the United States to visit a shaman in his home in Minnesota? Did they not know that they had spent unbelievable amounts of money and family connections to bring herbs from the mountains of Laos and Ca Cambodia here so that they could hang it in amulets around her neck? Did they not know how many animals were sacrificed in the courtyard of their apartment complex so that their souls could be traded? Those doctors were good Western doctors. They just had no idea of the spiritual tradition that the Lees came from. If you are a doctor in an American hospital, in this remarkable new hospital complex that is emerging in Grand Rapids, and you have a Hmong patient whose daughter is having a seizure, how will you understand their spiritual worldview in relation to that condition? Will you understand that making house visits matters in that community? Will you understand that perhaps changing the dosage on a weekly basis to get it right, as Western doctors are wont to do, creates more suspicion than it allays suspicion? Will you understand that maybe a seizure for them is both a physical challenge but also an opportunity for spiritual grace? Our hospitals are filled with Hmong shaman, Chinese Buddhist, Egyptian Muslim, Argentinian Pentecostal patients, all of whom might have interesting, unique, distinct spiritual and religious takes on a medical condition or a physical challenge. How you deal with that as a nurse or a doctor, I think is central to your craft, is central to your profession. These are three scenarios in what is the religiously diverse democracy that is the United States of America. This country is the most religiously diverse nation in human history. That's a stunning fact. Think about that for a second. More people from more different religious orientations have gathered in this political entity than in any other political entity in human history. Unbelievable. The most religiously devout nation in the West. Even Donald Trump is asked if he's read the Bible. Let's put it that way, right? In this country, people's rates of going to church, synagogue, temple, mosque, people's rates of saying grace before meals, people's rates of believing in God, 
are dramatically higher than in European countries, Australia, or Canada. Most religiously diverse nation in human history, most religiously devout nation in the West at a time of global religious conflict. So, will American religious diversity in our school systems, in our hospitals, on our college campuses, in our police departments, on our athletic fields, begin to look like the blood and war that is religious diversity in too many other parts of the world? Or will America continue to forge a different kind of model? A model of interfaith cooperation, a model where people who orient around religion differently engage one another in ways characterized by bridges of understanding and cooperation. Listen, neither path is inevitable, right? People like to say that diversity is our strength. Multiculturalism ought to be celebrated. But there are many parts of the world that are diverse, in which diversity is clearly not a strength. There are many parts of the world where diversity is a civil war. How do we make sure that diversity in America is not characterized by bubbles of isolation, or by barriers of division, or by bludgeons of domination, but by bridges of cooperation? I think there's actually a very easy answer to that question. The easy answer is we need to have a critical mass of bridge builders. Bridges don't fall from the sky. Bridges don't rise from the ground. People build them. People bring religious diversity together in conversations that highlight mutual enrichments rather than mutual exclusions. People create activities where others from diverse religious orientations can connect the deepest part of themselves to a common activity and therefore connect to one another. I think the hope for American religious diversity to forge a model of cooperation is a critical mass of interfaith bridge builders. That's why I love the Kauffman Institute so much. That's why I love this part of the country so much, because what this, what, 13 colleges in this West Michigan region are doing, what you all have done with Catholics and Jews and, ev and evangelical Christians and mainline Protestants and emerging Muslim community, what you all have done is special. Right? Your year of interfaith dialogue, your year of interfaith understanding, this is powerful. This is the kind of stuff that people all around the country come to look at and to learn from. And my highest hope from all of this is that you folks make a decision, a commitment to become an interfaith leader, to be the kind of person whose identity is tied up in building bridges of understanding between people who orient around religion differently, who look at the scenarios that I offered you, Hussein Abdullah of the Kansas City Chiefs, Wen Jen Liu of the New York Police Department, Leanne Lee, that little Hmong girl in the hospital in Merced, California, and you think to yourself, if I was a doctor there, if I was a coach there, if I directed funeral arrangements for the NYPD, what would I do? How would I handle the situation? How would I be a builder of bridges of interfaith cooperation right there? Because I'll tell you, those are three of 3,000. These interfaith scenarios are only going to grow in America, and we're going to need a huge quantity of interfaith leaders to engage them. I want to highlight three skills that I see are essential to interfaith leadership. This is not primarily a thinking thing. This is primarily a doing thing. How do you do interfaith leadership well? Skill number one, public narrative. Precisely what I went to see Jim Wallace for. The ability to tell a story that highlights the significance of interfaith cooperation. The ability to inspire folks about living into this vision. Howard Gardner, the great psychologist at Harvard, does a big study of leadership, publishes it in something called Leading Minds, and ultimately decides that leadership comes down to a single sentence. It says, what leaders do is tell a new story in the world and embody that story with their lives. And he goes through 
this range of leaders from Margaret that Thatcher to Martin Luther King Jr. to Mahatma Gandhi and said each one of them what they were able to do was to tell a new story to a constituency. In Thatcher's case, it was the United Kingdom. In Gandhi's case, it was occupied India. In Martin Luther King Jr.'s case, it was the United States. They told a new story about what the world could look like, and when people looked at them, they saw that world. They embodied it with their lives. What does it look like for you to, de to develop the skills of public narrative when it comes to interfaith leadership. What does it look like for you to stand up and tell a story of people from different religious backgrounds working together in positive ways? I think a part of this is knowing the history of interfaith, of interfaith cooperation, knowing that in 1893 there was a great event in Chicago called the Parliament of the World's Religions. In 10 days at Salt Lake City, there will be a reprisal of that event every five years. There's another parliament of the world's religions, this notion of lifting up a mass conference that lifts up the inspiring nature of interfaith cooperation. And the final line of the parliament of the world's religions in 1893, spoken by Charles Bonney, was, from now on, the great religions of the world make war no longer on each other and instead on the giant ills that afflict humankind. How do you weave historic stories like that with your own personal story? Your own personal story of how you've been inspired by people or ideas from other religious traditions. Your own personal story of how you have witnessed or been victimized by religious prejudice and how having seen it or experienced it, you don't want it to happen to anybody else and you commit to standing up against it. How do you tell a story that weaves that history, that personal dimension in with the theological dimension of why you as a Catholic look to Nostra Aetate as your theological inspiration for interfaith cooperation, why you as a Jew look to Abraham Joshua Heschel, why you as a Muslim might quote from a letter that Imam Ali sent to his governor in Egypt. You will find those there who are your brothers and sisters in faith and others who are your equals in creation. In all of our traditions, there is what I call a theology of interfaith cooperation, the ability to weave that in to a public narrative of why interfaith cooperation is significant, I think is a, a paramount skill for interfaith leadership. Skill number two, how do you create activities that people who orient around religion differently can come together and do powerfully with one another? I love to talk about Habitat for Humanity here because lots of folks know of Habitat for Humanity as an organization dedicated to ending poverty housing. But it was actually started with a twin mission, and the poverty housing one was only the first. The second mission was what Millard Fuller liked to call the theology of the hammer. Millard Fuller, the founder of Habitat for Humanity, was heartbroken that members of his own Christian community, Pentecostals and Presbyterians, couldn't be in the same room talking Jesus together. They yelled at each other too much. Too many differences on that. Differences about how the pastor should dress. Differences about what time church should start. But you know what they agreed upon? The importance of serving others. So Millard Fuller creates Habitat for Humanity as an activity that convenes people from across the Christian spectrum to connect their faith to service and to connect to one another. Well, if it's good enough for Pentecostals and Presbyterians, it's good enough for Muslims and Jews, at least that's what we thought at Interfaith Youth Corps when we adopted that model wholesale. There are a million things that people from different religions are going to disagree on. There are a million activities that you could create that people from different religions will come together and only yell at each other about. How do you curate activities that are convening activities, that inspire people to work together and share stories where they learn from one another, where they leave and they say, man, mine, I didn't know that there was such a rich service tradition in Jainism. I didn't know about the notion of the bodhisattva in Buddhism, that one who attains enlightenment can choose to return to earth and teach compassion, and that that is a vaunted figure, a vaunted position in Buddhism. I didn't know about tikkun olam in Judaism, the tradition of repairing the world. How do you create activities that bring people from these various spiritual, 
ethical, philosophical religions together to do something good and constructive for the world and to tee up a conversation that brings up the dimensions of mutual enrichment in various traditions rather than the dimensions of mutual exclusion. Finally, how do you facilitate a conversation where people can share stories in a way that are deeply felt and that are mean to them and that are meaningful to others? If you want to know the exact wrong way to facilitate a cooperative conversation, watch any representative five minutes of cable news. When I used to do cable news more frequently five or seven years ago, the producer would literally tell me, here is the person we're pairing you against, and I want to find the three areas where you disagree the most, and I want to ask you the most inflammatory version of a question on that area, because we want a cage fight on TV. What a terrible way of having a diverse democracy. I'm not interested in a cage fight on TV. I'm interested in finding people with whom I have some disagreements and identifying areas in which there are possibilities of work together, possibilities of dialogue. That takes an expert facilitator. That takes somebody who can set safe space. That takes somebody who can ask the right question. That takes somebody who can do the right follow-up. Facilitating interfaith conversation well, helping people identify areas of dialogue where there is both commonality and particularity, which is to say where people can articulate their own particular path to why compassion matters to them, why social action matters to them, why hospitality matters to them. That is a signal skill of an interfaith leader. If you want to know how to build bridges of interfaith cooperation, work on these three skills. The skill of public narrative, the skill of curating activities, and the skill of facilitating dialogue. And I have to tell you something. We're on a university campus, and every time I'm here, and I look out in the faces of 19 and 20-year-olds, I will tell you what I feel. I will confess to you something. My primary emotion is envy. Because you're at the beginning of so much. There is no place like a university campus when you're 19 years old. You know, in the last 20 years of my life, I've had the chance to travel unbelievable places and be with unbelievable people, with the Dalai Lama in Dharamsala, with Mandela in Cape Town, but the world was never as new and as open and as fresh and as possible for me as when I was on a college campus. The best place to learn these skills of interfaith leadership the best place to develop and practice your public narrative, the best place to learn how to curate activities that bring people from different religious and ethical orientations together, the best place to work on your interfaith facilitation skills is where you're at, is your college campus. In part because there's all of these other people who are here to help you learn those skills. That's why they exist, especially at teaching universities like Grand Valley State and Hope College and Aquinas. I'll tell you, the most disorienting thing for me once I graduated college was to wake up one day, six months after leaving the University of Illinois, and looking around and thinking to myself, where are all the people who used to tell me how great my new idea was? All these folks, the Dugs, the Katie's of the world, they're paid to help you make your great idea happen. They're paid to encourage your public narrative. They're paid to help you curate your interfaith activity. They exist in their professional capacity to help you develop those interfaith facilitation skills. I spent a lot of time going back and thinking to myself, what if I had all that video game time in college back? And it's kind of funny, but it's kind of sad, too. You know, what would I have done with it? What else would I have picked up, right? There's no place like an American college campus to learn how to be an interfaith leader. So if that's what your commitment is, if you're thinking to yourself, just like previous generations of folks thought to themselves, 
I want to be a human rights activist, or I want to be a civil rights worker. Contemporary generations also, those are still important things to be. Right? If you're thinking to yourself, just like folks say that, you're thinking, I want to be an interfaith leader, you're in the right place. At Hope College, at Grand Valley State, at Aquinas, you're in the right place. I want to end with this. Um, uh, I have a friend who's a college president in Moorhead, Minnesota. Uh, uh, at Concordia College. His name is Bill Kraft. And he tells this great story about where his college came from, what the legacy is, and what the future is, and how he wants his students steeped in the legacy of the college and how he wants to prepare them for the future. And when I come to Grand Rapids and I think about, you know, what the what the boardrooms in Grand Rapids look like, you know, who's meeting in the C suites of this town and what they look like. And I think about what the elementary schools look like. I think about what the hospitals look like. My guess is it feels like two different cities sometimes, right? So Bill Kraft talks about that, but he talks about it with a sense of joy and possibility. He says, you know, across the street from Concordia College is something called the Prairie Home Cemetery, as in the Prairie Home Companion, right? And in the Prairie Home Cemetery lay no small number of Concordia grads from 70, 80, 90 years ago. And just about every single one to a person is a Norwegian Lutheran. That's where we came from. We ought to be proud of that heritage. Those folks built this city. Those folks built this university. That's where we come from. Two blocks down the road is the Alcott Elementary School. My friend, the principal there, tells me there are 30 ethnicities that he has counted and eight or nine different religious groups. And that's not an official count. That's just like a picking kids off in the hall and talking to their families and figuring out a little bit where they're from. So that's the world that our students are going to be teachers and principals and superintendents in. Those are the schools our, their kids are going to go to. What are we doing at Concordia College that prepares our students to be proud of this legacy, the folks who built this place. They come from somewhere. But to learn how to teach in those schools, to know what it means when a kid says, I'm taking off for Yom Kippur. I'm taking off for Eid. To know what that means, right? How do you be a good teacher to an eight or nine year old kid if a kid is sharing with you a precious part of him or herself and you've never heard the word Eid before. You've never heard the word Rosh Hashanah before. How do we prepare our teachers for that world? Bill Kraft is talking about you all, right? You future teachers, you future nurses, you future doctors, you future business leaders. It's an exciting time in America. You're an exciting place to be on a college campus and you and me and all of us, we have lots of work to do to help America live into its ideal of a healthy, religiously diverse democracy. I'm proud to be in a place that takes that work seriously. Thank you. some time for questions and I know that some of the students are prepared for that there's mics on both sides I assume they're turned on or you'll get them turned on so please line up and uh, begin your questions and uh, we'll, we'll take them who's first I know the Hope College students have some <laughs> T take a place at a mic <coughs> Okay, so my name is Brandon Fitzgerald. Um, I'm a member of Student Senate. Is it on? Can you hear me? Okay, so um, like I said, my name is Brandon Fitzgerald. I'm a member of Student Senate, nursing student. Um, I try to be involved in as much diversity efforts as I can um, at the university. I was previously this summer at um, IFYC, and every time I've heard you speak, I'm just like, 
where'd the time go? Um, I prepared a question and it was gonna be completely unrelated from diversity work, but I will ask you some more questions tomorrow when I see you in the morning. Um, my big question for right now is what happened to your grandmother? Um, I oh, read the yeah. book, Katie Gordon had me read it, Acts of Faith, and after everything, I'm just like, okay, I know that I could pull so much like introspectively from me, but I really just want to know what is yeah. what is your grandmother doing because she was such an inspiration. Yeah, seeing what right. she does and what she continues to do at her age and yeah. Well, thank you for that question. So she died peacefully in her home six months ago at age 95 with her loving family around her. Um, hey. You know, when it's my time to go, may I die peacefully in my home at the age of 95 with my loving family around me, having, you know, scolded her nephew five minutes before or something <laughs> appropriately. Uh, so, you know, in a lalahi, in a lahi raju, and we are from God and we return to Him without doubt. Um, and she was a mercy upon the world. Uh, and I'm grateful to have been in her presence. Thank you for your question. Oh, oh okay. I don't know if this is Okay, hi. Um, my name's Allison Lopret. I'm a Hope College student in the Phelps Scholars Program, but I'm also an ambassador and a leader for an organization that builds global friendship and do creates activities for children as young as 11, um, children from across the world coming together for a month and just discussing global issues. But one of our issues that I would like to um, start to correct is bringing up religious dialogue because it's difficult. Uh, so what would you suggest as an organization that already fabulously creates dialogue, how do you bring up religious um, discussion and interfaith Yeah, I think it's a great question. So, um, so my expertise is not in the 11 to 12 year old age range, right? Right. Um, <laughs> uh, but I think it's hugely important. And by the way, one of the reasons IFYC believes in kind of a, a leadership strategy is precisely because w it's not about us being experts in everything. It's about folks like you figuring that space out and then standing on a stage in three years and giving a talk to 500 people who want to answer that question because they're also dealing with diverse environments of 11 and 12 year olds. So, so what I'm going to say is just kind of riffing off the top of my head. These could be terrible ideas, but I trust you to dismiss the terrible ones and to polish the, the nugget of something that's half good, right? So one thing is, is, to, is to see where something naturally comes up and to work with that. So for example, a, a kind of a quintessential example is religious holidays or religious fasts. So, you know, we just we just got done with uh, the Hajj season and therefore Eid, and we just got done with the, with the Jewish holidays, right? Um, and you will have kids who take days off, right? Um, you will have kids whose families are, are, are at Hajj in Mecca, right? And there is a reasonable chance that they will be secretive about it because they don't really know how to talk about it, right? So if you notice that, one of the things you can do is if you know Yom Kippur is coming along and you notice four kids gone, you know, there's a, some chance that they were gone for Yom Kippur. You might just want to engage them in conversation about that. By you want to communicate to them your respect for their identity and their tradition by the way you engage that, right? And I would begin in that kind of private way without bringing it to the group. And then as you develop trust with those kids and trust with their families, you might want to open up and say, listen, at a next holiday, at Passover, right? During Ramadan, let's say, do you want to do a presentation? about this for the group, right? So you're letting it come up organically. You are communicating your knowledge and respect for that identity and that tradition. You're building trust. And then you're very gently seeing if it can be used as something educational, right? I mean, it's funny, I've got, I've got two kids. I have, an, I have an eight-year-old and a five-year-old. And my eight-year-old will ask everybody whether they are Muslim. We'll be at a restaurant, and there'll be like a waitress with tattoos everywhere, and like a bone in her nose, or you're know, like in, like here or something, yeah. and she'll he'll be like, "Are you Muslim?" <laughs> and I'm like, "It's possible, Zaid, <laughs> but my you know, let's not ask everyone, right?" Yeah. <laughs> She's like doing whiskey shots at the bar, and I'm like, <laughs> "Probably not, right?" And my younger son Khalil doesn't want to talk about it with anybody. 
and part of what that means is you might have an 11 year old who's like over the moon that you're asking about Rosh Hashanah but you might have an 11 year old who's like I don't, I don't, I'm glad you know but I don't want to really talk about that right so that private of you developing the relationship and the trust and communicating your respect, I think is very important for that age range. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Ibu. I'm a really big fan. My name is Kathleen Maloma. I'm a freshman at Hope College and Phelps Scholars. And it's been such a blessing to have people who are so open and wanting to communicate and listen to uh, what your beliefs are. And uh, we had a trip planned for Dearborn on Saturday, and it was canceled in light of the anti-Islamic uh, rallies that were happening across America. And I was just wondering, how do you communicate and um, form conversations with someone who might not even want to listen to your opinion, not want to have a conversation, or should you even attempt to yeah. have a communication at all? I mean, that, that's, a, that's a great question. By the way, I mean, how crazy is it that we're living at a time of like organized anti-Muslim rallies at houses of worship, right? Uh, it's just, it's, it's sad. I mean, my, you know, um, my wife is taking our kids tomorrow afternoon to religious education class, and I'm thinking to myself, like, are folks going to show up at our Muslim religious education class and, like, protest this? My kids are eight and five. They literally, they are, they are blissfully unaware that anybody thinks anything bad about Islam or that Muslims people who call themselves Muslims do anything bad in the world. The only thing they associate with Islam, which I think is developmentally appropriate for an eight and a five year old, is like good stuff, right? Like everything from the Quran to the example of the Prophet Muhammad to Muhammad Ali and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, right? And it's just like, I think to myself like, some dude is gonna put a sign in one of my kids' faces that says uh, uh, Islam is violence, and they're gonna be like, what the, is going to be totally beyond their radar screen, right? And whether that happens to my eight and five year old tomorrow, it's going to happen to some eight and five year old. It's going to happen to a lot. I mean, I just, it makes me sad. And it inspires me that a bunch of folks who are not Muslim are like showing up at mosques and saying, this is not, this is not who we are. This is not who America is, right? And as Jews, as secular humanists, as Christians, as Hindus, we're going to stand with our, with our Muslim brothers and sisters against, against hate, yeah. right? So, I mean, thank you for your question. Um, it, reveals, it reveals something ugly in America right now, but America has had ugliness in the past and has gotten over past uglinesses, and I, I have every confidence that with the work of folks in this room and others, we're going to get over this present ugliness. Um, how do you deal with folks who might not want to have the conversation? So <clears throat> at IFYC, we always talk about playing for the 70%, right? Now, honestly, we're a moderate organization. As my friend Brendan and my colleague Brendan likes to say, we're not a shake the tree activist organization. We're not asking the question, how do we go after the hardest nut and crack it, right? We're asking the question, how do we move something from, uh, um, from early adopter to mainstream, right, in kind of geeky, in key, geeky business language. And so we're asking the question, how do you play for the 70%? So if I were in your position, I would ask myself the question, is the person I'm engaging with on the 30, you know, the 30% either side, 15% either side, who for uh, right wing stuff or left wing, left wing stuff is not interested in conversation? My own approach is to not spend a ton of time there because there's this vast group of people who want to be in that conversation, right? And ultimately, it's the folks who are in the 70%, who are closest to those other wings, who are going to play some role in, in moving the conversation with that 15% on those wings. You know, 2%, 3%, 4% at a time. It's not something that I'm good at. Uh, and it's not, it's not where I want to spend my energy. At the end of the day, time and energy is a zero-sum game. There's only so many conversations that I can have. There's only so much time I can spend. I would much rather spend this time with you strategizing about getting to the 70% than asking the, you know, thinking, how do I go find the, you know, an in, in anti-Islam bigot or a Muslim extremist type and, like, have the conversation with them. It's not, not the role that I would play personally. I hope that's helpful. Yeah. Hi. Um, 
So my name's Richard. I'm a graduate student. Um, I was hoping you would talk a little bit about the experience of founding IFYC and the, the entrepreneurial aspects and and the growth, like going through the process of trying to grow the organization yeah. and things like that. I mean, that's a gr I wrote a whole book on that, in Acts of Faith. Um, <laughs> so let me ask you something. Is there something specific you're interested in? Well, I, I'm, I'm really just interested because I am a person that wants to start an organization, yeah. wants to be a founder of an organization yeah. that does work in this type of realm. So, so hints along the way, so to speak. Um, I mean, I, people would tell me, and I, I wasn't smart enough to believe them at the time, but they're basically like, don't do this unless you think that this is the only way you're going to be happy. Because founding and building an organization uh, is, it, there's, a lot, there's a lot easier ways to make a living, right? Um, and I, you know, I just decided I'm not going to be happy if I don't do this. And so that's part of the reason I did it, right? Uh, what was helpful to me, a couple things were really helpful to me along the way. Number one, I really, I really not just believed in the idea, I loved the idea. And I loved learning about it. I loved, you know, the little scenarios that I gave you. Uh, those aren't things that I read in a book, except for one, I guess. But those are things I pick up uh, off of news stories. Like, I am constantly scouring, you know, my geeky news sources, the New York Times, the New Yorker, the Atlantic, for interesting interfaith stories. Like, I love this, right? I'm like on a weekend retreat with my wife, and I'm going to see uh, uh, Jim Wallace, you know? I loved the idea. There's a great grateful deadline. Without love in the dream, it'll never come true. You know, so for me that was really important to love the idea, and I still love. Fifteen years later, I mean, my guy Brendan, I pick him up at seven o'clock this morning. You know, we do a college trip a week, and I'm like, isn't this a blast? That he must be thinking, you've been doing this for fifteen years, man. Like seriously, every week you get in the car and you're like, isn't this a blast? I'm like, hell yeah, <laughs> I do that. You know, so. I mean, I love this, right? Um, two other things. Number one, uh, maybe three other things. I read a bunch of books of other people who started stuff. Um, that's why part of the reason why I wrote Acts of Faith, because I'm like, at some point, this will be helpful to a Richard down the road. So I hope it is. But I read Wendy Cops, One Day All Children. I read Jeffrey Canada's Fist Stick Knife Gun. Like I read the, the personal identity stories of other people who founded things, and it was super inspiring to me. Number two. Um, you find people who believe in you and you hold them really close, right? And, and to this day, you know, now I've got somebody who like, who's like the, the uh, she's like the dragon of my schedule. And her job is to like keep white space on my schedule and to like not have me overrun with meetings, right? And I tell her, I'm like, if a 19 year old kid with a new idea for an organization wants to meet with me, I will do it every time, right? And 80% of the time, I'll write the kid a check on the way out because the people who did that for me when I was 26, it's not a big check, you know, but it's like, here's 100 bucks. I love your idea for, uh, for a fresh food market in a bus that travels food deserts on the south side. Go do that, right? Put gas in the, in the bus for the next two weeks with this, you know? Finding people who believe um, that's, that's magic. My last piece of advice. There will be a bunch of people who say no the first time. Don't write them off. Go back in six months. Part of the reason they're saying no is because, honestly, having an idea is easy. I have 50 ideas a night. It's sticking with it for six months or six years or 60 years. That's hard, right? And so they say, might say no the first time to funding or to a meeting or whatever, because in part they're checking your seriousness. So you show back up in six months and they're like, man, Richard is serious. You show back up in a year, man, Richard is serious, right? Like that's, there's a, s lots of people like to start things. Many fewer people want to grow quality over the long haul, right? And that's what, that's what folks oftentimes want to check. I hope that was helpful.
Hi, I'm Ishmael. And Hi, I'm Ishmael. I'm also a Phelps Scholar from last year. Um, you actually asked a lot of my question, really what can we do if we want to dedicate an entire career to just inter interfaith? Um, and even if we can't necessarily incorporate it within our careers that we're currently in, um, what opportunities are there in Interfaith Youth Corp or something that we can pioneer our own? Um, that's basically what he asked. Well, what opportunities are there in your program for, yeah. for students to just see how it's like and you know, if it's something that we might want to do? Right. Yeah. You applying for a job? Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Well done. You a freshman? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> um, resume goes to the top of the list, <laughs> uh, top of the pile. Uh, I would talk to Katie Gordon. Okay. Katie went through, uh, when, when did you go to an ILI? So this is now her career. Okay. Right, she does this full time with Doug. Doug made this hilarious comment. Doug's like, I used to have several administrative assistants when I was the dean here, that's why his name is on a building. He's like, I now have an excellent program manager who doesn't like administrative stuff. And Katie looks and says, that is right, I do not like administrative stuff, <laughs> right? I mean, what she's built her own job under Doug. Mm -hmm. Katie's job is to inspire students like you to be interfaith leaders here at GVSU, at Aquinas College, maybe at Hope College, right? And there are more and more colleges and universities that are hiring people in the KD position, right? Um, I promise you, uh, hospitals, schools, community organizations, they're all gonna need people with religious diversity chops down the line. This is, you know, this is a growing professional area. How do you start? You should come to an IFYC Interfaith Leadership Institute. Uh, January in Atlanta, August in Chicago, talk to Katie about the awesomeness of them. Talk to Brendan who can help make sure you, you get to one, but that's the way you start. And then you do organizing on your campus. Mm -hmm. And then there's lots of leadership levels at IFYC. You know, I mean, we exist as an organization to help you become an interfaith leader. And Katie, did we help you? Did we play a role in you getting this job at all? I mean, we write, we write recommendations. We make phone calls. We have a whole alumni program at IFYC. Once you've gone through our college program, that will help you find a place as an interfaith leader. I mean, we've, you know, there's IFYC folks everywhere from the State Department to, to Harvard Divinity School doing this stuff. Oh, that's all great. So much help we provided. <laughs> Do this work for free. Her administrative skills were strong enough for you to hire her, Doug. So. And on my other question on that vein, even doing work on campuses like the campuses that we're on, um, in campuses like Hope College where there isn't a great diversity as far as for faith, what can campuses like ours do as far as instilling like conversations that will really inform, I guess, the college community um, about this movement? And so what can we actually do if there is, isn't a great, per se, religious diversity? I mean, y'all rolled up in here with like 100 people. So your campus knows about this, right? I'm pretty impressed by that. Uh, so look, I think that this is, um, I think that the answer to that is campus community partnerships. And Grand Rapids is a remarkably religiously diverse area. So you build partnerships with the refugee resettlement agencies. You build part, you know, the, I mean, this is the, what the Kauffman Institute and what the various consortiums here have done, consortia have done around interfaith cooperation is hugely inspiring. So for Hope College to, to plug into those partnerships, first of all, it's already a part of them in some way. But to get their students involved is not, is not that hard. But I would spend some time with Katie about her path and about how students can get involved in this kind of stuff. And I would, I would uh, run a lottery for a group of five of you to come to an Interfaith Leadership Institute at IFYC. That you can talk wonderful. to Brendan about that. Thank you. You on board? Yes, I'm on board. Yeah, All right, good. Board. Nice yeah. to see you. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, my name is um, Megan Lindstrom, and I am actually a student from Western Michigan University, which is an hour south of here. I just drove up because I'm a huge fan. Um, I am wondering, I am involved on Western's campus in a couple of interfaith groups, both one that is um, student focused as a registered student organization, and then also as a learning community where I am actually the only undergraduate involved. But what I am running into time and time again um, is Western is not <laughs> like Grand Valley. 
they do not understand the need for interfaith discussion, interfaith dialogue. There is very little call for it, which is very sad because we have several religious um, organizations that are arguing for space on campus to meet. They are arguing amongst themselves for events, funding, and there have also been um, several recorded hate crimes based on religious, um, in religious differences. There's just a lot of ignorance. And as somebody who um, reads the Kaufman Institute weekly that goes out and knows, uh, has read both of your books and knows that this is such a thing that could make such a difference, it breaks my heart. And I am trying, <laughs> how do I draw more attention to this? How do I get the powers that be to understand that this is a thing and that other universities are doing this and why can't we? Thank you for coming. That is a great question and it is the rare occasion where I have a direct and straightforward answer. I would bring Doug and Katie to your campus and I, I would have them, th they have built uh, along with uh, Dick and Sylvia Kaufman and the Kaufman family, who, who I'm very grateful to for their friendship and they also serve on my board at Interfaith Youth Corps, but they have built uh, a magnificent institute at a state university an hour away from your state university. Doug was a dean here for no small amount of time. He knows what senior level university administrative issues look like. Um, Katie is an excellent program person. I would bring them uh, for a series of consultations and perhaps a public talk. But the, the single best way to get somebody to move on something is to bring their peer into the room and have them say, this is important and this is how you can do this, right? And Doug helped make that happen here. And I, I imagine a, um, perhaps a cup of coffee and a good lasagna might uh, <laughs> might encourage him to make the, the trek to, to, to Western Michigan. So you, you, have, you have the national leaders in this and public, okay. public university education here. Thank you. Sorry to give you guys more work. <laughs> Hi, um, I also am a student at Hope College and my freshman year was in the Phelps Scholar Program and now I'm an RA in one of the residence halls as a sophomore. And, um, I'm really thankful for Phelps Scholars for bringing a little bit more religious diversity to campus, but it still is a very overwhelmingly white Christian reformed campus. And so my question is, how do you facilitate interactions um, of people with different religions without making the person who's not a Christian kind of feel like they have to be the poster child for their, their religion? Yeah. So, you know, I love places like Hope because it has a distinctive identity the people who come to Hope know what that identity is, and no small part of what a Hope College is about is formation in that identity. And I have a ton of respect for that, right? There are significant benefits to that, and there are some costs to it. And one of the costs is in certain dimensions of diversity. So I was just at Wabash College. You all know Wabash College? Okay, so it is a really robust, impressive culture for young men. And part of its distinctiveness is it's one of the three male colleges in the country. And it lacks a certain diversity, let us say, <laughs> right? But it is very, very rich in its formation of young men in, uh, in, in responsible manhood, right? So, you know, I did a seminar with 19, 20 students. Brendan and I did the seminar, and there was none of this, like, I mean, honestly, like 19-year-old dude stuff, like, you know, like all these guys were like leaned in, all of them participating. There was none of this, oh, to be, to be uh, smart or to participate is to be a nerd or to be a geek, right? But there's a cost to that, right? So I think that there is something really profound about Hope's distinctive identity and distinctive mission and its formation. And the challenge is in the absence of certain dimensions of diversity. So that is as it is. That's part of the definition of being at Hope College, right? So how do you have that kind of partnership? Uh, how do you bring in, how do you engage that diversity in positive ways, knowing um, that it might not exist 
in the immediate environment and not criticizing the immediate environment because it's been honest about who it is, right? And it told you before you signed the form who it was. So you partner with folks in the community. You partner with folks at GVSU. You partner with, with Aquinas College, right? You, you have to create that and you recognize that the rich formation you're getting in the reformed tradition and hope is going to prepare you in, in particular ways to go live in a world of diversity and you you do what you can with what you have right now and you know you go into the world in four years with a deep formation experience. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Great, we're done. So much fun. So much fun. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ibu, even though you gave me a lot more work to do. That's OK. Uh, for those of you that are interested in pursuing this, there are brochures in the back about a conference coming up later this month uh, at the downtown campus, it's a Jewish-Christian-Muslim dialogue. We do it every three years. We have an Orthodox rabbi from Jerusalem that's going to be here. We have the former president of McCormick Theological Seminary in Chicago that will be here. And we have the first female president of the Islamic Society of North America, Ingrid Matson, who's going to be here for a day-long dialogue. For those of you who are, are students, some of the professors at Grand Valley require the students to go to at least one of the sessions. There's three sessions during the day, and then there's an evening session. And what's interesting is that they come back, because of their class schedules, they come back to having gone to different sessions. Because one session is focused around Judaism, one around Christianity, the other around Islam. And they come back and have a very fascinating discussion, because they've heard different parts of the story. The other thing, if you're interested in more of what the Kaufman Institute is doing, our website is very easy. Easy. It's interfaith understanding, one word, dot org, O R G. Go there and check check that out. And uh, I'm happy to come to Western. Uh, what I think you mentioned the, the article. I started writing articles for the Grand Rapids Press. It's now in four Michigan newspapers that they publish that every week. And so, uh, yes, we want that word out. We're willing to, to go to other campuses. Hope is a part of an interfaith consortium of eight colleges and seminaries. Uh, maybe you don't know about it yet, but we're happy to work with you and, and find ways of making those connections. A couple of other announcements. I want to thank our co-sponsors for tonight. Appreciate what you've done. And also, You've heard about the book that Ibu has written, Acts of Faith, and then his other book, Sacred Ground. They're both available at the table in the back, and he will be available to sign books if you'd like to have it. Thank you for coming, and thank you, Ibu, for being with us. We really appreciate it.